Hello and welcome to episode four of the Pi Podcast, the show by members of the Raspberry Pi community for the Raspberry Pi community. I'm Joe. I'm Isaac. And I'm Albert. And coming up, we'll be talking about this week's big news and interviewing Tim Rowledge, who does development for Scratch. But before that, I hear you uh, had a successful meetup recently, Isaac. Uh, Yeah, last night we had the Raspberry Pi DC meetup. It was the third one, and we had uh, Taryn Sullivan from Dexter Industries there, and she was showcasing the GoPi Go uh, robot as well as the PyBox. She was showing that as well. She had a couple of the robots that were really cool, and we also had a special guest visitor in the house who happened to be in DC who was uh, Matt Richardson from the Raspberry Pi Foundation was there. And... uh, he had the touch screen. That was really cool. I got to play with that. I really liked it. He had the Astro Pie, which was also amazing to actually hold that in my hands. And it was really cool to have both of them there in-house showcasing stuff. And I think we had about 20-ish or so people show up. There's usually not that many people there. It's always the case with meetups, I feel like. But yeah, it was a real hit and successful meetup. I was very proud of it. Fantastic. Fantastic. I'd just like to say one thing I, I mentioned on the last episode that the Pi display that I was getting the rainbow in the top right hand corner. I found out afterwards because I didn't look that the power supply I was using was only a one and a half amp. I thought it was two. Uh, so the moment I put a two amp power supply on it, that disappeared straight away. So that was my bad. And uh, yeah, two amp uh, power supplies, you're fine. One and a half amp, eh, not so. <laughs> it worked, but best to get a two amp. Yeah, uh, good to know. Right. Well, we've got a very exciting bit of news to talk about. So let's get on with that. So the news that everyone surely has heard by now is that there's a new release of Raspbian based on Debian Jesse. Yeah, it's been uh, completely refactored from Wheezy to Jesse. For uh, people who don't know, Debian uses um, names based on characters from uh, Toy Story. So that's where Wheezy and Jesse come from. So there's a huge amount of work moving from one code base onto another one. And a major part of this has been moving the whole uh, interface across to uh, version 3 of GTK Plus. So it looks very similar on the screen, but underneath it all, it's it's all completely different, which means it's it's ready for the future. And uh, it's a modern operating system with all the modern technology that's available on Linux. So uh, it'll be even better going forward. Now, I actually had a chance to try this this afternoon on both the, the Pi 2 and the original 256 meg uh, Model B. And on both of them, I felt that it was much faster I must say. Now, I didn't run any tests, didn't have time for that, but from a subjective point of view, it felt just faster and quicker and easier and just better in every way, basically. Yeah, the the main thing that I had a look at, I put on a a Pi 2, and with the uh, interview with Tim, which is Scratch-based, I had a look at the Scratch stuff, and uh, they've included a a few different games, so people, if you're used to the old Scratch, uh, the, the examples that are in there are still there, but they also have some extra projects. So they've got the Asteroid game, a uh, Pac-Man game and a Space Invaders game, which are which are very, very playable. They're very, very good on it. And they look absolutely fantastic. So and, and I've run the Asteroids one on previous versions of Scratch because I did some testing early on. And no, it, it wouldn't have run. It just would not have run, but it runs very smoothly now. Yeah, I'm just now looking over some of the uh, features here. I see Java tools. That's what I see here. So I guess you can learn to write some Java applications using BlueJay and Greenfoot. Yeah, I know uh, BlueJay, I can't remember if Greenfoot was, but BlueJay was announced a while back as being available on the Raspberry Pi. And my wife has done a, a object-oriented programming course with the university here in the UK, and they use BlueJay. So it'd be great to see if the Open University, you know, expanded the uh, the set of systems that you can actually use to run their courses or to attend their courses to being the Raspberry Pi as well, because that would reduce the cost of actually taking part in learning to code even more if you can use uh, the Raspberry Pi for the BlueJ work. And then it's got Python to be able to do the Python courses and everything else as well. Yeah, I'm looking at BlueJ right now. It looks like a pretty, I don't know, I have to check out this IDE. I personally use IntelliJ quite a bit and I used to use Eclipse. One of the biggest differences from um, Wheezy was that it boots to the desktop now rather than boot into the kind of command line and asking you whether you want to boot to desktop. It's, you know, from a new user's point of view, it feels much more polished and smoother. You just, you know, once you've got it on the card, put it in, turn it on, and you're straight to a desktop, which I I know that some people have said 
well, we just want command line. But I mean, there is the option in there as well, because there's now the, the config that you were faced with um, on initial boot before. Now that's in the menu and you've got a nice GUI to, to go through that. And um, you can select it to only boot to the command line still. But I think that in terms of who this is aimed at, kids and teachers and people who are using Linux for the first time, I think that it was a very good move to, to make it boot to the desktop. Yeah, and I think the other big change is um, now that anything to do with writing to the GPIO, you do not have to be logged in as root. Yeah. So this is, if, if you think of it this way, if you were booting to the command line, then you'd remember to do sudo and everything would be easy. But if you were working from idle, then you couldn't just run your code from there unless you ran, you know, re-ran idle as, as root. Well, now you can just bring up idle, do your code, do your GPIO stuff with RPI GPIO, and it'll just work, which means you can do it all from the GUI without it being a, being a problem. And as well, Scratch now has uh, the GPIO capabilities built in. So this is this is a big shift. I know there's been a, a fantastic library that I've used, the Scratch GPIO from Simon Walters, and I've used that many a time. Well, now the uh, GPIO capability is built into the um, the image that comes from the ra from the foundation. Yeah, and this new version of Sonic Pi. And uh, the kind of big news on the desktop front is you've got LibreOffice and the Clause email client by default. So it, it's pretty much a fully fledged desktop, isn't it? And I mean, I tried LibreOffice Writer and I could happily sit there and write some stuff, no problem. I mean, I, I didn't get into spreadsheets and stuff, but uh, it, it certainly feels like it's getting closer and closer to being a viable desktop replacement. I'm curious if that's going to make the Raspberry Pi slower. I love all the stuff they're doing, but what are your guys' feelings on starting on bloatware? Well, that's a concern that I have seen quite a lot brought up, is that the image is now over four gigabytes, so you need an eight gig card minimum to put it on there. And if all you're looking to do is a bit of command line stuff and you don't need the desktop and all these applications, then I can see that it would be um, just a bit overkill, really. But... There is talk and plans of a light version, which will be stripped down and will just boot to the command line. I think that it would be good to see that as soon as possible, though. Yeah, I think from reading about it, the compute module has four gig of um, storage on it. So the with this image, it won't work on the compute module because it's uh, only got four gig of storage. So there's definitely a light version needed for those embedded systems. I mean, the way I look at this is if you don't run it, you don't run it. The chances are the cost of an eight gig card is probably less than what a uh, four gig was when uh, the Raspberry Pi was launched. True. So it gives yeah. you that extra headroom, and it's there for you. And again, if you think of the the educational remit, if you wanted to replace every PC in an ICT suite, you have to have office applications because they're still going to be doing presentations. They're still going to be doing documents, word processing, they're still going to be doing spreadsheets. So what this effectively means is, you know, schools can now actually look at not having Windows PCs, not having a big, huge PC, but having a Raspberry Pi for the traditional office-based type activities and also have it for Scratch with GPIO, Sonic Pi for learning music and programming in Ruby, and also for doing the Python work. It's it's all there for every aspect. It'll, you know, and then on top of that, you have Minecraft for programming again in Python. So it means that the Raspberry Pi could potentially be a, a, a true alternative to having desktop PCs in an ICT suite in a school. Because that's been one of the uh, the things that I keep seeing from teachers is we can't do all of these other activities with it. And also we can't have it as well because that's, too much kid in the room we can't we can't manage it i'm going to channel my inner joe here and become negative nancy i appreciate what they're doing but if that's the case i will just slap linux on those desktops and be able to do all this without needing to go get a pie or I, I mean, i'm glad they're doing uh, you make some really valid points there albert i just don't i don't know i like everything equally i see this getting just bloated in my mind i, I don't want the pie to do java stuff i don't care about LibreOffice, and i guess i could rip all that off if i wanted to i just feel like this is awesome at the same token this is becoming more i don't want to go buy another sd card for all this it's be i starting i'm starting to see like arduinos or beagle bone becoming more of an option because i'm not in the mood to deal with 
a, a desktop at the moment when I already have that, you know, at my disposal on another computer. My bit of negativity would be I'm not convinced that the Pi is powerful enough to do office stuff properly and in depth you know a, a bit of light wo- word processing or a bit of light spreadsheet stuff maybe but i think in an educational environment it might start to struggle when you're trying to tax it with some of the more complex stuff but i mean i've not really tried so i don't know i mean looking at this new release it does feel faster and i have tried LibreOffice on the old release and it did feel a bit clunkier than this so maybe they've optimized it to a point where they could do that but i think it remains to be seen on that score Yeah, I mean, to me, the big thing is that for primary schools and secondary schools, they're not doing crazy office type activities. They're learning how to use the tools and learning what the functionality is and doing a small amount of work on it. They're not doing, you know, corporate environment work in in these things. So I I think I think it'll be more than capable. And I think that's what I have to keep thinking in the back of my mind, because I, you know, LibreOffice, I'd used it once on the, the Mate install to do some posters, but it's not something that I'm kind of excited about. But if you could replace, you know, 40 desktop PCs with 40 Raspberry Pis, and if they could provide the functionality that was needed for a school, the maintenance alone on that would be lower. But also, you get Minecraft, you get scratch with gpio capabilities you get sonic pi you get programming and robotics with a piece of equipment that if something goes wrong it's 30 quid yeah you bring up a good point too uh albert in the end it's about the kids so yeah that's that's where it is i mean the, uh, to some extent us makers were uh, an added bonus we, we've gained an advantage because of what the foundation has done um, where I think we're a large part of the community. I think we uh, contribute back to it by showing what's possible so that the schools can, can take from that and use it. But we're not the focus. We're, we're not the focus. And, and that's why I, I think this new image really is showing the intention. I've heard Evan Upton being interviewed before saying, you know, you can now run a full desktop suite on the, uh, the Raspberry Pi 2. And I think this is just showing that that is actually possible. And then they've just enhanced the other things to make them even better, which is great. Yeah, well, no doubt we'll dig further into it uh, over the coming weeks and uh, we'll be checking out some of the stuff that we might have missed there. But uh, for now then, that'll do it for the news. Let's move on to the interview. We're now joined by Tim Rowledge, who's an arm and scratch guy. So uh, welcome to the show, Tim. Nice to be with you guys. So the first question, as always, a little bit of an introduction for yourself. I've been uh, working with ARM and Smalltalk, which is the the language that Scratch is implemented in since 1985 or thereabouts. Um, I've mostly done professional Smalltalk work over the years, um, plus some odd other things. Um, I've worked on small systems like Scratch. I've worked on big systems like massive banking and payroll systems for global corporations. Worked in research in Silicon Valley, and these days I'm sort of partially retired, but certainly relaxing up on Vancouver Island. Sounds great. So look, looking at the, the Raspberry Pi specifically, obviously the, the ARM thing was mentioned at the top. What's, what's your background with the ARM processors? I got interested in, in the ARM stuff uh, way back when, in my early days of being interested in small talk, because you couldn't buy small talk in those days unless you had huge amounts of money. It was strictly on very bizarre custom workstations made by Xerox. So I was interested in implementing Smalltalk along with uh, a few other people. And we heard about the ARM chip project starting, went over to Cambridge, um, beat up various people like uh, Sophie Wilson and Herman Hauser and uh, some of the other guys and managed to walk away with a, a nice little a uh, grey box that had uh, an ARM1 processor and I think four megabytes of RAM in it and started working with Elliot Miranda on a, a small talk virtual machine back then. We got it started working, I think, f- uh, April 1987 or something like that. And, you know, obviously that was under Risk OS. I worked with Risk OS stuff for a very long time. Even when I was in Silicon Valley, I made them 
um, allow me my, my risk OS machines, um, which was always amusing because it, it, it was a favorite of the IT guys in most places because it was different from all the boring old PCs and Macs. They actually enjoyed supporting this bizarre English machine. Well, we did want to talk about Scratch, but I mean, you've brought up Risk OS there. There is a version for the Raspberry Pi. Have you had any involvement with that? Yeah, that's actually how I got involved with the Raspberry Pi in the first place. Um, the Scratch system was written in a version of Smalltalk called Squeak that I've been working with since 1996. And the, the guys at MIT wrote it on the assumption that you would have a you know, fairly big Intel laptop to run it on, which of course is quite fast by comparison, especially to an early Pi B. And so they were trying to make it run on the Pi because it's you know, such a good kids teaching thing. And it, it didn't run very fast, um, to say the least. So one of the guys that was involved uh, in, in the early stages of that uh, pointed out, well, you know, Tim Rowledge is around and he's got a bit of experience with making small talk run well on arms. We should pass it over to him. And so it started from, from there, really, a single email saying, Tim, where can we send a Raspberry Pi for you to start playing with and see if you can make Scratch run faster? And that was two and a half years ago, I think, now, and continued from there. Started off doing it on Risk OS because that's what I had all the, the tools set up for. Um, but sadly, you, you, can't, you can't really continue doing that with the very latest versions of Scratch because Risk OS just doesn't have the, the threading support and, and so many other things that are important. It's a bit, a bit sad, but that's life. I ran Risk OS on on the Raspberry Pi, the the original B, and it just surprised me how how fast it was, and how you know how high performance it was, and how quickly everything moved around and ran. And it, it just, I felt that it would have been fantastic if a system could be built on that. But then this, you know, reading about it, the shortcomings of what it couldn't do based on a a modern operating system like Linux kind of explains why Raspbian is the the default. It, it is amazing how much faster Risk OS runs on, on the same hardware. Um, it, it always was a, a, a fun thing to show to people in Silicon Valley of, you know, here, here I've got this 200 megahertz strong arm Risk PC against your you know, 500 megahertz uh, large house priced Spark station. And look, it runs faster. Ho, ho, ho. It, it is very sad that no really big development can be done on risk OS because there just isn't the money behind the community to do anything about it. Yeah, it looked like the Raspberry Pi could be the thing that would bring it back into the to the limelight, but I, I, I think that moment has probably passed at this stage. It, it did apparently make for a, a very big uptick in, in interest in, in risk OS, uh, at least for a, a couple of years. I, I haven't had time to really keep paying attention to it, sadly. I, I do have a fresh crate of Raspberry Pi Bs um, just arrived at my doorstep today, actually, so I might even be able to find time to put Risk OS back on one of them and see what the, the latest system is like. Tim, I've been reading about Scratch, and when I read about it, I see stuff talking about Squeak, and I'm not for sure what Squeak is. Can you give me and the listeners what a little brief rundown about Squeak? Sure. Um, way back in the mists of time, back when personal computers cost you know, more than a high-end BMW, there were a bunch of, of crazy people, um, old friends of mine at Xerox Park. Uh, chief amongst them, uh, Alan Kay, Dan Ingalls, Ted Kaler, uh, Adele Goldberg. And they were trying to make computers of the future. Uh, Alan Kay's uh, doctoral thesis from 1969 is possibly one of the most important technological documents of the last century. Uh, and I urge everybody to, to look it up and read it. And he came up with the, uh, the basic ideas for a language that they called small talk on the grounds of, you don't want it to sound too impressive because then everything that you deliver looks good. Whereas if it's some massive, exciting name like Zeus Mega Pro, and you only deliver a typical system, everybody's going to think you're a loser. So they came up with this little language called Smalltalk, which was the original 
really object-oriented system. There, there were object-based systems before then, like um, Simula, and you could argue that um, Lisp had a lot of the same facilities wrapped up in far too many uh, parentheses. Uh, and within that system, once they got it going on, on the, the fabled Xerox Dorado 16-bit, 70 megahertz, bipolar logic, um, industrial monsters that required a refrigerated room to survive, they, they built this nice little object-oriented system that they then gave to a bunch of, of um, secondary school kids to play with. And some of those kids did interesting things like write electronic circuit simulators and um, early versions of, of what you would recognize as a sort of kid's version of Mac Paint and animation systems and so on. And then that sort of grew and became um, an industrial system. IBM used to do a version called Visual Age. Uh, a couple of other companies took it up in various ways. And, and I actually worked for the, the company that spun off from Xerox Park for a few years, uh, managing the small talk development team. Squeak small talk is a direct descendant of the original version that Alan Kay and his bunch of, of crazy guys put together when they were actually uh, working for Apple. And it got dumped in the public domain um, after many long discussions with the late Steve Jobs. And it took off as a, a hobby for a lot of people, as a professional money-making thing for some of us. And basically, since 1996, I've worked almost entirely on writing software in, in Squeak Smalltalk. And Scratch is just another, albeit rather important, application um, written in that. The basic Squeak system is available for Raspbian. It runs exactly the same, albeit a touch slower, as it does on Windows, Mac, x86 Linux machines, and so on. Uh, it, as in bit compatible. If you design a user interface, it will look pixel for pixel identical across all those machines. Yeah, I've seen the icon in the menu under programming. I've just never clicked on it because I'm gone. I, I don't know what I'm looking at. No. Yeah, unfortunately, the default Raspbian distribution doesn't in include a rather important, um, crucial file called the image file, which is the memory dump of, of all the objects. Uh, it's something that really does need to be addressed to make life a bit less confusing for anybody that <laughs> clicks on that icon. There's, there's another thing for the to-do list to try and get the uh, the foundation to, to include it. Yeah. Uh, it, it works very nicely uh, on the Pi. Um, we've recently uh, got the very latest virtual machine, which is uh, a dynamic translation engine um, working, and the version of Scratch that will be coming out very soon uh, is based on that and it roughly, depending on exactly what you're doing and whether you're measuring, strictly speaking, scratch speed or other big benchmarks written in small talk, anywhere between three and six times faster. That'd be good. So scratch on, on the Pi, I remember running it when it came out first. So the, the, the literally the first release and, um, Putting it politely, it wasn't that pleasurable just because the interface and everything moved so slowly. When you got involved, what, what needed to be done to improve the, the performance? There was quite a long list of, of things that we've done. Uh, the original version of, of Scratch was written uh, a long time ago uh, by a very clever chap called John Maloney, um, who writes brilliant stuff, but often not the very best engineered of, of code. Um, and so there was a lot of places where I could make fairly trivial improvements and get small speed ups. And there were a bunch of places I found where I could just use better algorithms and better factored code and fairly quickly got uh, things like the uh, Asteroids game written in Scratch, which is, is quite a good test because there's a lot going on there. Um, I got that running somewhere around four times faster fairly quickly. So we worked on, on that level. Uh, ben Averson over in Cambridge, who uh, is heavily involved in the, the Risk OS open um, group uh, and also wrote uh, acceleration code for 
uh, Pixman, I think it's called, under Raspbian. Uh, he rewrote uh, a lot of the, the uh, BitBlit core of Scratch. BitBlit is the original bit block transfer uh, operation that Dan Ingalls developed, uh, came up with back in uh, the mid-1980s at Xerox Park. It's the whole idea of taking a rectangular area of, of a, a bitmap and copying it somewhere to another bitmap. In the meantime, inverting bits, merging bits, mixing bits, saturating colours, all that kind of stuff. The, the whole basic graphics industry is based on, on, on that and its developments. So Ben made massive speed ups in that just by being able to make use of the, the arms, um, uh, what they call it, the neon instructions and so on. And even in a lot of places, simply putting a, a preload instruction. So when you know that you're about to lo load a long row of pixels, you issue a preload saying, I'm going to touch these memory addresses real soon now. And by the time you actually get round to doing anything with them, they've been loaded into the cache and they're available nice and fast. So those yeah. added up to a pretty, pretty big improvement straight away. So you talk about improving uh, performance and stuff. Are you using, to, you're doing Scratch through this, are you using the interface of Scratch that I see on the Pi or are you using Scratch as API? Um, I, hmm. How to, how to say, uh, all that user interface that you see is written in Smalltalk. So I basically work in the tools behind Scratch, which by the way, you can get to in your Scratch image relatively easily, though not completely. If you uh, click on the top half of the R in the, in the word Scratch on the top left of the, of the, the screen and um, hold down the Shift key as you click, you will see a menu pop down that includes uh, turn off fill screen or something like that. And that will then shrink the, the scratch user interface down and you'll see a border around it where you can then click and get a, a menu that will have things like browser and workspace and a bunch of other tools. And that, that's then the full small talk world minus some important bits that are nice to have, but you can still do some some looking around the code and so on there. Okay, so I could play with Scratch without having to do the interface because coming at it from a coder's perspective, I appreciate the interface for helping kids learn to code, but it, it's driving me up a wall having to use that. But I didn't realize I could tie in with the API behind the scenes to just develop with Scratch without the the nice usable interface. Yeah, you, you can't write Scratch scripts that way at the moment. That is something I would like to, to expand into ultimately, sort of being able to textually generate Scratch scripts. Uh, but you can get to the Smalltalk tools and see how it's all implemented. So in terms of projects that uh, involve Scratch, I've seen hundreds, but I mean, are there any standout ones that you've seen that are really utilizing it um, in interesting ways? One of the, the, the more dramatic ones is a full-scale implementation of Pac-Man, which is quite amazing. Um, it, a couple of, of guys wrote it one evening, apparently, in a massive, presumably caffeine-fueled hacking session. And it is a full Pac-Man. You know, they, they even imported the, the original soundtrack stuff. And it's been interesting because it's, it's really, really uh, beats up Scratch um, performance-wise. Um, when we started, you were able to get maybe one frame a second, which really isn't playable. <laughs> yeah. Um, and now on a Pi 2 with the latest uh, dynamic translation uh, virtual machine we, we, uh, that we call COG, uh, we get, um, I think it's 25 plus frames a second, which is oh, so that's playable like enough that I certainly can't beat it. <laughs> <laughs> That's fantastic. It, it is an, an, an interesting improvement. And there's, there's more to come. There is a lot more to come. I, I, for some parts of, of the running of Scratch scripts, I'm fairly convinced that some parts of it I could make over 100 times faster just because of the way it's implemented. Uh, the user interface is, is, a, is a slightly different matter. It involved moving, you know, Big the, the big dialogues, you know, for opening files and so on, involve moving a lot of bits around. And, and even with Ben Everson's BitBlit work, that takes time. The, the Pi does not have 
you know, a 256 bit wide, three terahertz memory bus. It's it's got a nice little school bus that comes along and de- delivers your bits uh, on on a somewhat gentler schedule. So does that mean your expectation is that the act of coding it itself, so dragging the blocks around the place and building your program, will be will work well, but then the programs you create in the end can run a lot faster. Yeah, that's more or less it. And it depends, of course, on what your program is doing. Scratch is often seen as, as just moving a sprite around on the screen. And then you get people saying, well, I can move a sprite around thousands of times faster than that. But it's doing huge amounts of clever stuff behind that enable you to have many sprites running their own scripts, um, interacting. You know, you can add variables and lists and you can manipulate those lists. Uh, and of course, there's then the uh, the mesh network stuff that enables it to broadcast through sockets to other programs, um, like uh, Gerhard Hepp's huge collection of, of um, device driver stuff, um, like uh, Simon Walter's Scratch GPIO. Uh, and indeed, it can talk to other scratches, so you can run you know you can run ping pong across a, across a classroom. And in fact, the, probably the biggest change that's coming up soon is that we've now got an internal GPIO driver that I've been working on uh, that doesn't need to broadcast across sockets, which means that you can have this G, the internal GPIO driver running and still broadcast the same or even different stuff across sockets to other machines. So should that make it more uh, reliable or faster or... Consistent uh, on, somewhat on faster. The um, there's no setup. You don't have to load another program. So the idea really is is not to be dramatically different to any of the existing systems. It's mostly about you turn on the Pi, you start up Scratch. Everything's just there, going, no fussing. A teacher can can start a class right away and say, "Okay, kids, load the script that drives a, a Pi Maroni Explorer hat." So it's going to support the the various hats and the various add-on boards that are out there because there's this a lot of people doing fun things with those. Currently, I'm able to support the Explorer hat, Pi Glow, the Pi Face Digital, the Pi Light, the uh, uh, the Sense hat, of course. Mm-hmm. Um, a couple of motor driver boards. Um, I'm working on en- the Energini. Um, wireless electrical socket control stuff and probably some other things that I don't remember right now. The idea is that uh, in the in the future you'll be able to just download um, what I call a screwdriver file, you know, script a scratch driver. Screwdriver sounds more fun. Uh, and drag it from the the desktop and dump it on top of Scratch, and it will install the software for. A, a device that we hadn't thought of before. And is there a, a kind of a, an ETA or expected release for that? All I can say really is as soon as we can, as soon as we can get it out, I'm, I'm wrapping up a lot of stuff right now. And uh, we've been doing some external user testing and, and finding those places where, ah, yeah, you know what? We forgot that this stuff has to be installed and that if it isn't installed, things will break. Uh, Please develop a framework in the future, Tim, that is called itch. Please do that. So you could, if you have an itch, you could use Scratch to fix that. would be so awesome. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, there's there's too many puns that you can use in the (laughs) Raspberry Pi and Scratch world. It's it's just worrisome. So if listeners are looking to help out with Scratch, where's the best place for them to go and uh, find out some info for that? Um, to help out with it, um, that's an interesting question because it's unless you are a skilled small talk programmer, there's not much you can do in respect of, of helping develop it. Testing is another matter. Trying it on pies with you know different configurations on different size screens. Um, for example, we discovered not that long ago that if you, as I do, run via XRDP because I've got a bunch of pies and I couldn't have enough screens and enough desk space to have each one with a separate display. Uh, there's a problem with 
the way XIDP works and you have to pseudo all the time, which is annoying, but at least it works. Um, we're using the uh, wiring pi libraries from Gordon Henderson. And in order to talk to the GPIO, that means you also have to do pseudo, which is a bit of a pain. So there's stuff like that configuration wise that people can test and, and uh, tell us about. And there is a, a GitHub project um, for the scratch on the Pi, github.com slash raspberry pi slash scratch. And if you have a suitable user on GitHub, you can enter issues and find out what I do about them and volunteer to test them and download the latest stuff and so on. Okay, and if people want to uh, hassle you on Twitter or something, have you uh, got a website or a Twitter or Google Plus or anything? Uh, I don't do the Twitters. Um, I am available at uh, tim at rolage.org for email. Um, fairly obvious spellings. Um, and I do my best to, to respond as soon as I can, but please don't be offended if it takes a while. There's a lot of work going on here. <laughs> Fair enough. Well, we could have talked to you for hours and hours, but as usual, time is the enemy. So um, thanks for coming on the show and giving us your time. You're very welcome. Thank you, Tim. And I said I'm looking forward to seeing the, uh, the new GPIO library working and uh, the Im improvement in speed. Should be out soon. Thanks, Tim. Yeah, that was a really good talk with Tim. Uh, unfortunately for our listeners, we talked with Tim, I feel like, for like another three to four hours after that interview. But he had a lot to say, and it's amazing how far small t uh, small talks is still prevalent in this world. I just keep forgetting languages like that still do a lot behind the scenes, and Tim is definitely at the forefront of that movement with Scratch. Yeah, what I found amazing was I, I asked the question afterwards that it, it, you know, it sounded to me like from the big projects that he's worked on, that Scratch is this, you know, n near like hobby project. He said, no, they, there's some amazing engineering going on behind uh, the code to get this put together. So Scratch in itself is actually quite a complicated application um, that needs the capability of small talk. And uh, yeah, it, it, it was fantastic stuff to see what they've done with it. As Isaac said, Tim had a good old chat with us afterwards and gave us some other pointers and some other information. And it really looks like uh, he's been involved with the computer industry for years. Yeah, I'd learned some stuff about the history of uh, of computers and the, the dot com bubble and stuff. It was uh, it was great to talk to him. But with that, then we're coming to the end of another Pi podcast. If you want to get in contact, you can email show at the podcast dot com. You can find us on iTunes, Stitcher, YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, or leave a comment on the website. Thanks for joining me, Isaac and Albert, and thanks to everyone for listening. We'll see you again in two weeks with more Raspberry Pi news, interviews, and discussion. Bye, everyone. Take care. See you later.